So I was a student in Tel Aviv a few years after Yukio joined, and it was a, an amazingly stimulating environment. It was really a, the best place, I think, in the world to be a, a PhD student in physics. Um, and many people apparently heard about this, and we had many visitors coming from everywhere. And one day we had this uh, very uh, you know, exciting meeting uh, of the two uh, Bristolites, Yakir and uh, uh, Michael, um, who I don't know if ever met before, did overlap sometime in Bristol, if I remember correctly. And I remember uh, Michael defining this as a, uh, uh, saying, I feel like in, a, in an interference experiment where you go along one trajectory and I go along the other. And he keeps saying, let's hope it will be constructive. So I think, you know, time proved it to be a constructive interference. And I'm, I'm happy to call uh, Sir Michael, Professor uh, Michael Berry, uh, to talk about decades delightfully entangled with Yakir. It's the uh, late 1970s, and I'm sipping grappa with Giulio Cassati on his balcony overlooking Lake Como. We're discussing quantum chaos, but he suddenly changes the subject. He says, you must know about the aharonov bohm effect because uh, you're from Bristol where it was discovered. Can we talk about it? Well, I didn't know about the aharonov bohm effect in those days. Um, it was discovered, as we heard, when Yakir and uh, David Bohm, A and B, had spent several years in Bristol in the late 1950s. And when I arrived in 1965, they'd already left. AB was occasionally spoken about, but I hadn't looked into it. I should say, when they were in Bristol, I was at high school applying to universities, and Bristol turned me down. Okay. Now, Giulio Cassati wanted my opinion because he and uh, Italo Guarneri had written a paper confirming AB using an unusual formalism, actually one that Bohm had developed. And this was awkward for them because it contradicted a paper by two of uh, their teachers in Milan who had argued that AB was non-existent. Now, I looked into this at Giulio uh, Cassati's uh, prompting and I was startled and intrigued by the beauty, the cleverness, and the subtlety of AB. And uh, it quickly became clear that they were right and that the teachers uh, were wrong. And this began the first of my several entanglements with Yakir. So here's my quick non-technical account of AB. Although Isaac Newton was spectacularly successful in explaining the motion of astronomical objects by gravity acting between them with nothing in between, he found this action at a distance absurd. And that scepticism re-emerged a century later when electric and magnetic forces were found to similarly act at a distance with nothing in between. Uh, you know, uh, um, a magnet aligns to the Earth's North Pole, even though there's nothing touching it. Einstein reported he found that magical when he was a child. Now, to manage this magic, physicists, including uh, Faraday, imagined that objects like masses, charges and magnets, currents, were the source of what came to be called fields, filling the spaces between them and other such objects. Now, fields were quickly regarded as real, and they still are because they give immediate uh, explanations of phenomena without requiring action at a distance. Um, do you remember these old-fashioned TVs, these old-fashioned fat TVs um, with their cathode ray uh, tubes? Well, uh, inside those tubes, uh, there are uh, magnetic fields, magnets, which control electrons, and electrons paint the pictures. So the painting of the picture is controlled by fields, and so for 60 years, mass entertainment was governed by this very, very down-to-earth definite uh, field. Now, enter A and B. They argued that in quantum physics, an electron can be influenced by magnetism somewhere else, even though there's no magnetism where it is. Now, that seemed paradoxical, and paradox is a uh, persisting theme of Yakir's research. 
You can think of it as kind of ghostly, an electron influenced by nothing touching it, except something called a potential, previously regarded as merely a mathematical convenience. Now, in their detailed calculations, the uh, magnetism somewhere else was uh, a line of magnetic flux in one of their calculations. Here it is, uh, for example, uh, produced by a, a coil. Um, and uh, the electrons go around it, they do different paths. And uh, the phenomenon they predicted, which is uh, uh, inter a shift of the interference fringes of the electron waves on a screen beyond, was soon observed by our colleague, Bob Chambers, and uh, our late Bristol colleague, and others followed. Now, I became involved in two ways. First, by showing that the quantum wave that uh, AB predicted can be precisely mimicked in classical physics by ripples on water. The, uh, uh, this is the, the geometry of a, a, a depiction of, of, of their wave, but ripples on water. The uh, ripples model the electron waves, and they ripples encountering a bathtub vortex, which models the magnetic field. There's a, a precise analogy. It was fun to make uh, that uh, connection. Now, this connection illustrates a very beautiful statement by, again, our colleague, our late colleague, uh, uh, Charles Frank. By the way, he'd made an important observation which led to the first experimental test of, uh, of AB in the 1959. And he declared this, physics is not just concerning the nature of things, but concerning the interconnectedness of all the natures of things. Well, my second involvement was with the mathematical expression of AB's wave. Now, this isn't going to be a talk about uh, detailed discussion of mathematics, but I will show it to, to you, even though it's not the occasion to explain it. And I'll show it to you. Here it is. Just look at it. Because I have enjoyed a more than 40-year love affair with this particular mathematical object, finding physical and mathematical features hidden within it and alternative ways to express and calculate uh, it. I've had a huge amount of pleasure from this equation. Now comes a second of our three entanglements. It concerns a little feature hidden in quantum physics that I found in 1983 called the geometric phase. Motti already uh, mentioned it. Now, it's an abstract thing, but to describe it using familiar analogies, think first of dropping a cat upside down. Well, she quickly turns and lands right side up. And that seems mysterious because there's no force, no torque acts to turn her, to rotate her. Her angular momentum starts out zero and it remains zero. There's a long and complicated history leading to the uh, understanding of that uh, cat phenomenon. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Good. Uh, recently described, actually, in a rather nice book, uh, Falling Felines and Fundamental Physics by Gregory uh, Gabor. And she can turn because she's not a rigid body. She can change her shape. Uh, so here she starts out with one shape, twists and twists and twists and twists, and she ends up more or less with the same shape except that she's turned. Uh, different parts of her can twist oppositely and sequentially. We say she's made a cycle in the space of shapes, after which she's turned without ever having been rotated. It's ghostly again. Now, here's another example. You park your car in a narrow space, and you park it badly. You're, you're some distance away uh, from the curbside. You have to perform a, a repeated series of manoeuvres, reversing and uh, driving and forward again, after which you get a little bit closer to the curb. And this sideways shift is analogous to the, uh, uh, to the 180 degree turn uh, 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 of the cat. It's, uh, uh, it, it's this cat's change of shape is analogous to this little cyclic maneuver that you perform to get a bit closer each time. So here's just one more. Uh, start at the North Pole uh, with a javelin pointing forwards. Here it is. Walk along a meridian of longitude down to Africa on the equator. Here we are. And the rule is you must never rotate this javelin about the local vertical. You just keep it painted forward. 
Um, well, now walk east to Singapore, there you are, and then up again along a meridian back to the North Pole, and uh, the javelin's pointing in a different direction, even though you've never rotated it. Well, all these examples involve a ghostly kind of geometry, where something changes globally after a cycle without ever having changed locally. Now, the geometric phase applies this to the geometry of the quantum states of small things, electrons, neutrons, atoms, molecules. You can think of the states as waves, is, is quantum physics. And imagine slowly changing the forces that act on it while it's waving, in such a way that the forces at the end are the same as before, a cycle of the forces. Well, uh, why slowly? We'll get to that in a minute. Because it guarantees that the quantum state at the end is the same as at the beginning and hasn't been contaminated by a transition to other states. Well, not quite the same, because the wave at the end is out of phase compared to the accumulated wavings that you would guess. Now, this phase change reflects a cyclic change of the forces that have acted on the thing. AB was an example. You can think of putting electrons in a box, taking them around the magnetic flux, and when they come back, their phase is exactly the phase that AB had discovered uh, uh, shifts the fringes in their experiment. Now, enter Yakir and the late Jiva Anandam. They shifted the perspective by removing the slowness restriction. They pointed out that what really matters is that the quantum state returns after a cycle and not how the change is achieved by changing external conditions. The change can happen at any speed, it needn't be slow. Now, although I welcomed this viewpoint, I persisted in uh, examining uh, slow because it has implications in other areas of physics and mathematics that I was involved with, but also because I could see no general way of making the state return making it uh, return to its original uh, uh, s uh, uh, structure, other than forcing it slowly. But much later, in uh, uh, 2009, I developed a general protocol for changing quantum states at any speed without contamination by other states, and that was in a different context. It was to do with laser cooling and other, other things. But it restored my appreciation of what Yakir and Jiva Anadan had done. Now, only after those two entanglements did I at last meet Yakir, as, uh, 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 as was mentioned by Adi. In 1989, I was visiting Weizmann, and Yakir invited me to give a talk in Tel Aviv. And I spoke about something quite different. I spoke about the mathematics of infinite series illustrated by understanding rainbows. But the encounter went very well, and we had a good conversation, and established a personal uh, rapport. The following year, I invited him to Bristol. He gave several talks in what I came to recognise as his inimitable style, pacing back and forth, deep in thoughts, apparently improvising, but creating a completely coherent, perfect story with very few visual aids. In those days, it was transparencies. Yakir stayed in my home. He was a congenial house guest in spite of his disappointment that uh, none of us has the slightest interest in chess or indeed any other competitive game. It must have been quite emotional for him to return to Bristol after 30 years, especially since his earlier visit as a PhD student was his first trip away from Israel. Every morning he left early to... Uh, uh, to take long walks to gradually refresh his memory of the streets and of the streets of Bristol. Or so we thought. The real reason, it later emerged, was so he could smoke, indulging his passion for high-quality cigars. Okay. Now, at that time, 1990, he was elaborating his theory of weak measurement. And that incorporated his earlier two-time idea that the quantum physics of now can be regarded as influenced not by what just happened before, but by influences from the future. Now, that sounded crazy, but Yakir emphasises that it's not a revolutionary <laughs> new theory. It's an unconventional way of expressing ordinary quantum theory with the advantage that it suggests new experiments, many of 
which have now been carried out. As all of us who know him will recognise, he talked constantly about his new ideas. And I confess that although I was fascinated, I didn't understand much, and I was especially mystified by an enigmatic and, of course, paradoxical, Yakir being Yakir, uh, utterance that later evolved into my third entanglement with him. So this is what he wrote. I can imagine a box containing only red light, but when I open a window, a gamma ray emerged. So here's the red light in a box, here's a window, he opens and closes, and he predicted a gamma ray emerged, and then, and continuing now, wondered how that could possibly uh, be. It seemed paradoxical because red light has uh, long waves and its photons have low energy, whereas uh, gamma rays have short wavelength and their photons uh, have higher energy. Well, later, and I only later understood, was a few years later, and I was smitten by a clariton. Clariton, that's my term for the elementary particle of sudden understanding. Every scientist knows what the clariton is. The moments we all cherish when the mist of obscurity dissipates and something suddenly becomes clear. We're also unhappily aware of anti-claritons, their unwanted arrivals that come tomorrow and annihilate what you thought you understood yesterday. Well, it didn't happen with this one. What I suddenly understood was that underlying Yakir's red light was red light and gamma ray, was a deep and beautiful mathematical phenomenon that I will try to explain. Central to our toolkit of mathematical concepts concerns quantities that depend on something else. We call them functions. You know, stock market as a function of time, for example. Uh, and this something is often positional time, but it can be almost anything. Now, the idea central to our practice is something called Fourier analysis. Many of the scientists here will know what I mean. Is that these functions can be expressed as a series of faster and faster oscillations. Think of a piece of music. The sound signal can be decomposed into its pure tones, its harmonies. Even a single note consists of a fundamental and its overtones. For analysis is very general. Even the sequence of prime numbers can be expressed usefully as a series of uh, harmonies, a strange arithmetic music, which, by the way, it sounds horrible when you, when you render it. Now, for many functions, the sequence of these Fourier oscillations is finite. There's a fastest oscillation. And until the 1990s, it was natural to think that nothing can vary faster than its fastest oscillation. But what underlies Yakir's enigmatic utterance is the contrary. There are functions that can vary faster than their fastest Fourier constituent, and they can do so over arbitrarily long intervals. Well, I call this mathematical phenomenon super oscillations. There had been partial anticipations in the mathematical literature and in uh, radar antenna theory, but in 1990, the idea was ready to emerge clearly and definitively. And this often happens in the history of science. As uh, the mathematician Whitehead uh, put it, um, everything of importance had been said before by someone who did not discover it. And indeed, this also had happened with the Aronoff bohm effect and with geometric phases. There were precursors. Now, super oscillations sounds like an oxymoron. How can something vary faster than its fastest constituent? By being very small. In the regions where super functions super oscillate, they are tiny. Here's a function of the type which has a fastest oscillation. It's big, it varies from zero to a million million. Now look at a tiny region hidden in here. Um, and, but by the way, this is, the far, this is what you would expect on the basis of the fastest Fourier component. You would expect no oscillation faster than this. But hidden away, just in, inside here, a million, million times smaller, is this little super oscillation. There's one example of, of hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, it's easy to forget um, how amazing this is. 
uh, super oscillations, one way you can understand it is using a concept from the physics of waves. Super oscillation corresponds to extreme, almost perfect destructive interference. It almost cancel, but not quite. Um, when Thomas Young demonstrated uh, wave interference in the 1800s, the most surprising features were the dark fringes in his two-slit experiment. As Arago pointed out in his obituary of Thomas Young, who could have imagined that darkness could be engendered by adding light to light? Allow me, allow me to expand a little bit on this. <coughs> One plus one equals two seems obviously true. And in pure mathematics, it is obviously true. Actually, not quite obviously. When Whitehead and Russell recreated mathematics from the ground up using logic, one plus one equals two was their first example of a non-trivial calculation. It occurs halfway through volume two of their book. But still, we all accept that as mathematics, it's obviously true. But as applied mathematics, one plus one equals two is not always true. Two people generate a child. One plus one equals three. Two water droplets flow down the windshield of your car in the rain and coalesce. One plus one equals one. And so it is with wave intensities. Two waves with intensities one and one can add up to something different from two, even zero. This is what Thomas Young discovered. And the idea feeds through from 19th century physics, wave physics, into our present uh, physics, where quantum states can superpose and cancel, leading to more ghostly paradoxes, elaborations of nothing, as uh, explored in particular by Yakir and Lev Weidman and colleagues in Tel Aviv. Now, back to super oscillations. I recalled something much later. In a sense, I had already known about this idea in the 1970s. Then, John Nye, my senior collaborator in Bristol, who was there when uh, Yakir and David Bohm were there, we discovered the generalisation of Thomas Young's dark fringes. Typical waves in three dimensions contain lines of zero intensity around which the light energy circulates and where the phase changes infinitely fast, where the waves super oscillate. We didn't understand that at the time. And these lines are now called optical <coughs> vortices. Not just optics. As I'm speaking now in this room, uh, the sound wave is threaded by these zero lines, threads of silence, which move past your ears too fast for you not to hear them. Um, well, I belatedly realised that I had sort of understood an example of this many years before. That was 2017 when I realised that. And uh, since then, super oscillation theory merged with optical vorticulture, as I called it, and the two subjects have advanced together. What do you call something that you sort of knew but didn't realise you knew? Following Donald Rumsfeld, you can call it uh, an unknown known. Okay. Now, the idea is practical. Super oscillation underlies several ways of seeing things that are smaller than the wavelength of the light employed to look at them, sub-wavelength microscopy. One of several ideas underlying uh, Stefan Hell's Stead microscopy that won him the Nobel Prize several years ago is that although there are limits to the uh, smallness of what you see with bright light, there are no such limits with dark light. Super oscillations, ghosts again. The weak measurement that was Jacquier's original insight are now thriving areas of current theoretical and applied research. Yakir and I never collaborated. We have different scientific styles. Yakir enjoys many collaborations. I occasionally collaborate, but mostly work alone. And when even I do collaborate, I write the joint papers and analyse, agonise over every single word. Um, Yakir thinks with colleagues while standing at the blackboard and rarely writes the papers that result. 
I'm happy to acknowledge our decades of entanglement. And I'm using that term deliberately in its quantum sense of a ghostly mutual influence with no direct interaction. We've both been very fortunate that our joint researches have been recognised, uh, uh, our various researches have been recognised individually, but our entanglements have also been recognised jointly. We were both, it was mentioned, awarded the Hewlett-Packard Europhysics Prize for Condensed Matter Physics, which was amusing because it wasn't a subject that uh, we had worked directly on. Also, the Wolf Prize was mentioned. Now, Yakir, um, 90 is not an interesting number. It's a unitary perfect number. It's the sum of its unitary divisors, including itself. It's also a pronic number, the product of two successive integers. There it is. But 90 isn't prime. 89 was, and your next one will be when you're 97. But nevertheless, you are certainly in your creative prime. Elsewhere, I've described you as quick and, quick and deep and subtle. Now I add another phrase. With your many startlingly original and pregnant understandings, the result of decades relentlessly pursuing our most fundamental physical theory, I call you quantum wise. Now, allow me a final thought, particularly for the non-scientists here. A few weeks ago, I visited an institute in India, and walking to the physics department there, I saw a woman ahead of me, slowly sweeping leaves from the path. Sweepers do this all day. Each has his or her stretch of paths. As I approached, I heard her talking, and seeing trailing wires, I realised she was speaking into a mobile phone. Later, I saw that all the sweepers were doing this, and I suddenly realised they were making direct use of quantum physics. Our mobile phones are quantum physics machines. The transistors in their circuits are deliberately designed, uh, to, according to the solutions of Schrodinger's equation, to optimise the materials, the solid materials. I emphasise quantum, of course, it's not more. Uh, also electromagnetic machines, optical machines, acoustic machines. There is an intellectual and cultural continuum linking Yakir's fundamental thinking about quantum physics to applied physicists or optimising materials, engineers designing the circuits, worldwide manufacturing marketing, to those sweepers in India clearing the paths while converting, conversing with their friends and family on quantum machines. Yakir, happy birthday.